Greetings, ladies and mandalgens, and welcome to this latest episode of Tales, Tales from Outer from Space. Out space. Taken from the subreddit HFY. The links to all the stories will be down below, and as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do, please consider subscribing. Please note that this is a sequel to the story The Humans Are Coming. The link to that story will be in the description down below. Time to Meet the Humans, written by Runner1. A lifetime ago, he worked as a transcriptionist for the Galactic Conference. He had lived a comfortable existence in the conference home world, his position allowing him the privilege of rising later than most to perform his duties in the comfort and safety of the Capitol office building. Although not a job to lead the fame, riches, or power, he had enjoyed reasonable hours and a generous relaxation time. But that all had come crashing down in the blink of an eye. The humans had swept across the conference like wild beasts, through a field of younglings, but he had known what the outcome would be, even before they came. From the moment he had viewed the indomitable logs, he knew. Somehow, deep down in his gut, he knew that the conference would fall. He had decided to get as far away from these humans as possible. Loading up his small family, he headed out to the most remote colony world he could think of. Perhaps he was motivated by fear, or perhaps it was a simple desire to see his son grow up before the humans caught up with him. It was on that small, distant agricultural world that he settled. There had come to be a farmer. There he made a new life. He did get to watch his son grow up, and on that world now he watched his grandson play and it was on the same world where he had watched his wife grow old, and there he had laid her to rest, in the soil far from the world of her birth. Now he looked up from the same soil as the sonic booms of the human ship shattered the stillness as they swept across the pinkish sky. The yellow-skinned female pulled the small child tighter and turned toward the ground vehicle. The young yellow-skinned male turned to follow. Wait! said the elderly being as he reached up and grabbed his son's arm before getting out of reach. You can't fight them. The young man paused and slowly turned back towards his father. There were tears streaming down his face. I know, Dad, he said, but what choice do we have? These humans overthrew the conference in a matter of months. They ran through their soldiers as though they were nothing more than stalks of grain. That's my point. These humans cannot be stopped. I realized that a very long time ago. Look around you, my son. This world is the hind side of the galaxy. Why do you think I brought you and your mother to a place like this? It wasn't for the scenery. I know, father. You ran away to protect us, and I'm okay with that, but there is nowhere else left to run. That's my point, son. We can't fight them, and we can't run. So what's left? Sobbed the yellow-skinned female as she wrapped her arms around her spouse and pulled the three of them together. Do we just wait here and die? The older being slowly lifted himself up from the wicker-like chair that he'd been sitting in. Reaching towards a nearby doorway, he retrieved a walking stick from its resting place in the corner of the doorway. As he stepped forward, it was clear that he was in pain. His joints were stiff from advanced age and lack of proper medical care. Groaning in discomfort, he mused, Well, that's one price we pay for being this far out. The young alien male reached out and embraced his frail father. Where are you going, Dad? He asked. I... I'm going to town. The yellow-skinned being skillfully guided the ground vehicle towards the center of town a few kilometers from his father's farmhouse. To his right sat his mate, tears of fear and certainty dampening her face. Between them, playing with the toy spacecraft, sat their son, securely strapped into the youth safety seat. In that passenger seat, directly behind the operator's seat, sat his father. The elderly being sat silently with his hands crossed over the top of his walking stick. He gazed out the window at the building slide by as the ground vehicle traveled almost silently over the smoother roads of the small town. The vehicle rounded a corner and a crowd of people appeared, gathered in a small town square. It was clear that the word of the humans arriving had spread quickly, though the repeated sonic booms of arriving landing craft would have been a heart to miss. Slowing the vehicle, the driver continued forward towards the center of the gathered mass of beings. Slowly, the crowd parted and allowed the vehicle to drive nearly to the center of the gathering before stopping. The shutting off of the engine, the young man stepped out and they opened the rear door, allowing his father to stand from the vehicle. 
Though there was an overlapping cacophony of voices and sounds, most agonizing in fear and arrival of the humans, several voices could be heard well above the others calling for volunteers to fight the humans. As the elderly being stood, many in the crowd recognized him as one of the settlement's oldest and most distinguished citizens and grew quiet. As the elderly being slowly walked around the vehicle, supporting himself with his walking stick, more and more present recognized him and they grew quiet too. Continuing forward, he reached the elevated platform in the center of the square and started up the steps. With each feeble step, the crowd grew quieter. At the top was a young town chairman. It was his job to see the small community on the outskirts of civilization ran smoothly. Long ago, the original chairman assigned here by the Galactic Conference had grown old and passed from his life. Without the stabilizing support of the Galactic Conference, no one knew what to do, and his lieutenant had simply taken over. When he too grew unable to serve, his lieutenant had replaced him, and so the process had continued on for decades. By now, a young male born and raised on this world, a being that had never known the conference rule, served as chairman. The young chairman stepped aside as the elderly being reached the top. Across the square, an almost palpable hush covered the gathered mass of beings. The elderly, yellow-skinned being paused for a moment before he slowly turned to face the crowd. For long moments, he stood silently while he scanned the faces of the crowd. Amongst them were the young and the old male and female businessmen and laborers. Beings from all walks of life stood looking up to him. What words do I have for them, he thought. What would a coward possibly say to calm their fears? A coward? The words, although spoken only in thoughts, reverberated in his mind as though they were the sound of thunder rolling across the countryside. Am I a coward for protecting my son? He thought as his eyes were drawn to his son still standing in the open door of the ground vehicle. Suddenly, it was as though a bolt of lightning had hit his psyche. Straightening up, he took a breath of air and spoke strongly and forcefully, as though he was much a younger man. Citizens, a lifetime ago, everything we knew, everything we believed, was taken from us. Those of us who were alive can remember. The Galactic Conference was everything. The Conference ruled all. The Conference gave all. And the Conference took all. To us, the Galactic Conference was as solid as a timeless as the stars themselves. To many, the Conference was something to put faith in, if not a religion in name. Faith in the Conference was a religion in practice. But we had that faith stripped from us. In the wink of an eye, the Conference was gone, torn asunder by a new force in the galaxy. A race of beings who only a few years before thought they were the only life in the universe. A race that did not even have FTL travel until they stole it. No, they did not steal it. The conference gave it to them. The conference, following its own rules and procedures, handed the humans FTL travel on a platter, and, uh, in a self-righteous arrogance, the conference failed to see the repercussions of such would follow. Now, those same humans that took down the most powerful institution in the galaxy that has ever known stand at our doorstep, and I hear calls to fight them. You cannot fight a hurricane. You cannot fight a thunderstorm. They are forces of nature. You learn to live with forces of nature. You build your house on high ground far from the sea. You place lightning rods on your house to protect it from the lightning. And you build your roofs and walls to survive the wind. These humans are a force of nature. And if we are to survive, we must find a way to live with them. For a long moment, the crowd was silent. And then slowly, a single pair of hands began to clap. It was his son still standing by the open door in the ground vehicle. Slowly, almost cautiously, a second pair of hands joined the first, quickly followed by a third, then a fourth, then a fifth. In a matter of seconds, the applause grew to a crescendo of rackish cheers and yells of support that continued for long minutes. Presently, another voice began to rise above the rest, at first not understandable above the din. The voice repeated, still drowned out by the others. It repeated for a third time, then a fourth time. Slowly, the roar of the crowd diminished to a lone voice could be heard. How? How do we live with them? They conquered the galaxy. They destroyed the conference. And now you say that we have to live with them. How do you know that they will even let us live at all, much less with them? The source of the voice was not visible, but the effect was. 
The crowd once again grew silent. Every face turned towards the elderly being on the platform, as though waiting for an answer. Still standing straight and firm, despite his age, the elderly being raised a hand over his head. I will meet with the humans. No, you can't, a single voice cried out. Slamming the vehicle door shut, the young male surged through the crowd and bounded up towards the steps of his father. Dad, you cannot. You gave up everything to protect me and Mom. You can't throw that all away. Reaching out, the elderly father took his son's hand. Son, I did not give up everything. You and your mother were everything. Oblivious to the crowd, he pulled his son close and hugged him. I came to this world to protect you, he whispered in his son's ear. I came here because I could see what was coming and I wanted to see you grow up. I wished for you to have a life. And now, the elderly being pushed his son back and held him at arm's length, looking first towards the ground vehicle where his daughter-in-law stood holding their grandson and then back towards the young man and returned his voice to normal levels. Looking at you, your lovely wife and son, that wish, all of my wishes, they have been fulfilled. But father... The elderly being lifted his hand and placed a single finger over his mouth. Shush, he whispered. I now have a new wish. I want my grandson to grow up just as you did, before you place me in the ground beside your mother. I want to know that ye too will continue. Is that not what you too wish? Of course, father, answered his son almost as a whisper. Son, long ago I saw what these humans were capable of. I saw it in the recordings of the captain's log. I heard it in the sound of the captain's voice, but uh, I also saw something else. What was it, father? Here in this world, the humans have always been perceived as an unstoppable evil. Everyone has lived their entire life knowing the humans only as a force that destroyed their way of life. But I've seen something different. I don't understand, father. You have known for your whole life that I was one who transcribed the logs of the first contact with the humans. Of course, everyone here knows that story of how you quit your job the very next day and moved mother and me as far away as possible. Yes, everyone knows that story, but there was more. More? I don't understand, father. Well, there was the logs of what happened to the Indomitable after the humans snuck on board that motivated me to leave the conference homeworld. There were many other logs both personal and official, included in the log buoy dump. I learned a lot about these humans through those logs. I don't see how the ships and personal logs could teach you anything about humans. I was able to read about the crew members' interactions with the humans before the attack. There was one thing I know. The humans are capable of logical and reasonable action. But father, the elderly being cut him off. No more buts. All of us here saw the human ships arrive. All of us saw that there were three large craft, possibly transports carrying who knows how many troops and weapons. We all saw them land. They could only be a few kilometers east of town. And I have no doubt that while we have been standing here, getting time and worrying, the humans were preparing to, if not already heading towards this direction. Ending his speaking, the elderly being turned and stared down towards the steps. The crowd parted in silence and allowed him easy access to his son's ground vehicle. Rounding the operator's door, he started to lower himself into the operator position. Before he could lower himself into the seated position, he felt a tug on his arm. Turning, he looked directly into his son's eyes. You are not going alone, the young man said. No, I won't let you come, replied his father. This will be dangerous. He glanced down towards his daughter-in-law, who now stood only a few meters away, clutching her child while tears descended her face. You... Have a family. And if you fail, father, what would it matter if the humans are here to attack and if you fail to reach an agreement with them? We're all dead anyway. If I do fail, then at least you have a little bit more time with them. The younger being looked towards his family again and turned back to his father. You're not going to fail, father. The ground vehicle glided to a stop. Just ahead, partially shrouded in clouds of dust, the human convoy lumbered towards them. It was impossible to see how many vehicles were approaching as they traveled mostly in single file. However, it was clear that there were many vehicles present, all of them large transports. If the vehicles were carrying troops and weapons, the fears of the townspeople were absolutely justified. It would be a slaughter. Opening the passenger door, the elderly yellow-skinned being stood and, uh, using his walking stick for support, moved around the vehicle to the middle of the road. 
A pair of humans could be seen in the open-top bleed vehicle. One was the operator, and due to all shiny metal decoration and rank insignia, the other was clearly in charge. As his eyes fell upon the elderly yellow-skinned being standing in the middle of the roadway, he raised his arm into the air and clutched his fist. It, the vehicle behind him, another human saw the raised arm and duplicated the gesture, and his action continued throughout the convoy, and soon the entire group rolled to a halt. The human in the neared vehicle spoke a command to the vehicle op operator and, uh, opening the door, climbed down from the elevated passenger area. Reaching the roadway, the human turned to survey the mass stop vehicles. A few moments passed while he seemed to size up the situation. Presently, the human turned the other way and walked in the direction of the elderly yellow-skinned alien. The near silence in which he moved was quite disconcerting. The only sound could be heard was the crunch of gravel under the human's oversized boots. The human continued forward until he stood with his arms reach of the elderly yellow-skinned being. And then he stopped. End of chapter Story number 2 The Humanitarian Issue Written by Runner 1 There are many different life forms in the galaxy. There are crystalline-looking creatures that vaguely resemble Earth arachnids inhabiting a hot, rocky surface of Tartarus III, bathed in the chlorine gas of their home world's atmosphere. They consume the very rocks beneath their spider-like feet. On Josh Jean 4, large lumbering creatures that look more like walking mountains than living things subsist completely and only on carbon dioxide they extract from almost liquid an atmosphere that exerts pressure more closely resembling that found at the bottom of Earth's deepest seas. And on Prosian 2, live amphibian creatures that could pass as crabs from any of Earth's seven seas, though they are life, not one of those creatures exhibit any behavior that could be remotely considered sapient. From the day mankind became aware of his place in the universe, scientists and biologists were warned that it was highly unlikely that intelligent sapient life on another world would resemble what they found on Earth. They warned that when mankind did encounter a sapient intelligence, we might not even be able to recognize it. We were warned that we would never be sure what pathway sapience, intelligence, or even life itself might choose on another world. But then sapient aliens did come, and those warriors were forever relegated to the vast sea of disproven hypotheses. The aliens arrived in great massive ships, large enough to easily be seen from the ground, and from the ship came Lotharians, aliens not so different from humans. A single, belatedly symmetrical body, two legs for locomotion, two arms ending in hands with digits for manipulation, and instead of five fingers, each of these beings had six, with an extra appendage as a secondary thumb on the other side of their hand. Atop of this mostly familiar set still alien body sat a single head with two ears, two eyes, a mouth, and a nose. Make no mistake, they were different from humans. Their skin was vaguely yellow-colored, and while they had two eyes, their eyes would have appeared much more suitable had they been found in one of Earth's thousands of species of snakes. And though they had hair, their hair would have been more suitable on a beaver or otter. And their ears, though functioning exactly as human ears functioned, resembling those found on a cow, goat, or some other farm animal, albeit smaller. Despite the warnings, it would appear that these were pathways for intelligence, and nature had found that pathway. Though up close, the difference was very apparent. From a distance, standing side by side in the shadows, it would be impossible to discern a human from a Lotharian at first glance. On a far distant world, a human and a Lotharian stood facing each other. The human had just traveled thousands of light years across the interstellar void, while the alien, though not of native to this world, had spent most of his life on it watching everything play out behind the false security of a vehicle windscreen as the alien's adult child, Caletho. Although not born on, Caletho had grown up on this planet. His father, fearing for his safety, had brought him and his mother to this world a lifetime ago. Until this moment, the humans were nothing more than a childhood terror brought on by the stories of demons from another world. But now, he sat clutching the controls of his ground vehicle, barely beyond an arm's reach, in front of a clear windscreen stood his father, face to face with the same childhood terror. Oh, he had seen humans before, but only in illustrations and on video displays. Never, in his wildest of dreams, did he ever consider that one day he might find himself this close to one. 
Though larger than a Lotharian, Calitho hoped that the human face to face with his father was not a beast of nightmares that he had always imagined them to be. Time seemed to grind to a halt. Calitho could not decide if the human was waiting for his father to speak, or if his father was waiting for the human to speak. Or uh, maybe both. As though he could sense the tension in the air, the human seemed to decide that he would make the first move. Slowly and deliberately he raised his right hand and extended it towards his father. Ignoring the pain in his joints, the smaller alien stood facing the human and seemed to tower over him, almost a head taller. The human presented an imposing visage. Humans were generally symmetrical, but despite their imposing size, his upper body seemed far too muscular for this size. With close-cropped silver hair, he wore a light green uniform that seemed designed to blend in with the foliage. On his right side, in a brown pouch, was tucked was clearly a weapon. Despite his armed nature and imposing figure, he seemed to be making a deliberate effort to appear non-threatening as possible. Glancing at the weapon and then looking back towards the large convoy of what appeared to be military vehicles lined up behind him, it was clear that, uh, had he wanted to, this being could have killed him, his son, as easily as one that would swat a bug. After a long moment of silence, the human raised his right hand and extended it. My name is Colonel Yuri Armstrong. I bring you greetings from the First Interstellar Republic, he said in an almost perfect Lotharian. Confused, the alien stood in silence, not knowing how to respond. Slowly, the human reached out and extended arm further and took a hold of the alien's opposing arm, moving it up and down motion as he appeared to be operating a manual water pump. This is called shaking hands, he said, a traditional human-friendly greeting. Quickly grasping the concept, Ragar pumped the homan's arm and returned. I am Ragar, he said before adding, friendly greeting, does that mean that you have not come to wipe us out? The expression on the human's face changed. Wipe you out? What could ever make you believe that we were here to do that? He responded, his powerful voice booming across the countryside. Ragar seemed to search for the right words for a brief moment before he replied. You did attack the conference homeworld, and it was my understanding that you wiped them out. That was ages ago, replied Colonel Armstrong, and, uh, he added, the conference attacked us first. You may not be aware of the fact that the conference ship destroyed our larger city, killing nearly four million innocent humans. I am aware of this event, responded Ragar, discreetly skipping the fact that he actually worked with the conference at the time. It was my understanding that the destruction of Paris was a punitive act under the conference law for failure to pay legally assessed taxes. The human colonel tilted his head and paused for a moment. His demeanor seemed to change as though something in Ragos' words drew additional scrutiny. Quickly returning to his former demeanor, the colonel continued. As I said, that was a long time ago. Things are different now. So why have you come? Well, the Galactic Conference had ruled for so long, many worlds were not prepared for life without the Conference guidance. Apparently, it was the Conference that forced many worlds to get along. Almost as soon as the Conference fell, a world called Aberidus attacked its neighbor, Loratha. Eventually, we were forced to intervene in that conflict in order to prevent them from annihilating each other. While we were working on that conflict, another pair of neighboring worlds, Jeren and Resiax, went to war, and then another conflict popped up. More conflicts quickly followed. It started to look like life without the presence of the Galactic Conference. The Galaxy was going to descend into chaos. We were aware of the strife after your people came. We are not completely cut off from the rest of the galaxy here. Well, we finally managed to get a grip on the situation, he replied. And for the most part, the galaxy has settled down into peace. Trade between worlds is now greater than when the conference ruled. By the way, that was how we knew you were here. For years, there have been rumors of a group of colonists that fled right before our attack on your homeworld. I was given the job of finding you. At this time, it was Ragos turned to tilt his head in scrutiny. But why now? Seeming to relax, the human adjusted his stance. You want the official answer to that question, or the real answer? For a long moment, Ragos stood in confused silence. Official or real? I don't understand. Seeming to become more comfortable than the human reached out and placed a hand on Ragar's shoulder, and for a moment, perhaps, may I call you that, for some reason you seem to remind me of my grandfather, and that's what I always called him. After considering the human request, Ragar nodded his head and answered, I would be honored. Please continue. 
Removing his hand from the small alien's shoulder, he reached into his pocket uniform and took out a brown cylindrical object. Bringing it to his mouth, he bit one end and spat the removed piece to the ground. Placing the remaining piece between his lips, he extracted a small silver object from another pocket and in a single swift motion flipped it open and activated some mechanism that spanted a small frame. Bringing the glowing flame to the end to the cylindrical object, he inhaled deeply, closing and returning the silver object to his pocket. He took a smoldering cylinder from his mouth and blew out a cloud of smoke into the air. The cylinder seemed to be made of brown leaves, tightly rolled together. Now that's a fine Havana. You know, a good hand-rolled Havana might be one of my favorite things that could come out of your attack. Ragar watched in fascination as the human placed the brown object in his lips and once again spewed out a cloud of smoke into the air. You know, thanks to the 70 years of political dick-waving, it was illegal to import these into my home country. But once you guys came along, all the old political posturing was out the window. Our whole planet came together to beat you. Ragar shifted his stance uncomfortably. Seemingly sensing the alien's discomfort, the human took the cylinder from his lips. Officially, we're here on a humanitarian mission. For some reason, mysterious lost alien colonies seem to be a popular topic in my home world's culture right now. And this world always seems to rise to the top of the discussions of lost worlds. Eventually, some politician got wind of your existence and, um, here I am. I still don't understand. Blowing another cloud of smoke out, the human answered. Perhaps I've been a soldier my whole life. If there is one thing I've learned about politicians is that every one of them is concerned with re-election as they are about doing their job. Most of them more so. So, some senator decided that it would look good if he could make an impression with the voters with his dedication to humanitarian issues. It didn't take interviewing too many cargo pilots to track you down. Turns out there are a few cargo pilots willing to make the run this far out. Once we located a pilot that had been here, it didn't take too much time to convince him to talk. Still not completely clear on what the human soldier was trying to convey, Ragger answered the large being. You use the word humanitarian. Does that mean you think that we are holding humans here? The colonel seemed taken back. Humans? No. Oh, I see. No, 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 oh no. Since we learned of the existence of intelligent life beyond our own, the word humanitarian has grown to mean so much more than it once did. The word now means that we have concern for helping and improve the welfare and happiness of any sapient life, as well as working to save the life of any sapient species and alleviating the suffering of those sapients. So, you are here for our well-being. Well, yes, though the motivation of the senator that got the ball rolling might be less than altruistic, we are here to help you. We plan to establish a regular trade routes and passenger service to your world. And all of that operating under the careful control of the human-run Interstellar Republic, I'm sure. Somehow, despite the very physical difference, Ragar sensed that he had offended the large human standing in front of him. Taking the smoking cylinder once again out of his lips, the human reached out and took the yellow-skinned alien by the arm. Please, uh, walk with me. I want to show you something. As they started to move away from the vehicle, Calitho opened the door to stand. Before he could exit this vehicle, his father turned to look at his direction. I'm all right, son. Stay where you are. I'll be back shortly. Ragar followed the human around the large, bulky transport vehicle, and when they reached the rear of the vehicle, the human reached and pulled up a large lever. With a mechanical groan, the large, ramp-like door swung open, and the human stepped into the sloping platform, turned, and offered Ragar his hand. The elderly, yellow-skinned alien stopped onto the slope of the joints crackling, stifling a grunt of pain. The being followed the human up the ramp and into the nearly full transport vehicle. Using a primitive iron tool, the colonel pried open one of the large crates that seemed to be made of dense plant material. Reaching in, he withdrew a smaller container that seemed to be made of synthetic material. It was brown and roughly rectangular in shape. The sides swelled, and though their current tents were beyond its capacity... This is what we back home call an MRE, the colonel said. It means meal, ready to eat. Tearing it open an overstuffed container, the human withdrew a smaller packet and tore it open also. Placing his lips on it, he took a bite. Not the best food in the galaxy, he said between chewing his teeth, but I've always been partial to these cherry crumb cakes. Here, try a bite, he added, extending the packet towards the smaller alien. Ragar reached out and took the half-eaten cake from the human, Cautiously sniffing the alien food, he sensed a vaguely fruity aroma. Deciding that the humans would not have come halfway across the galaxy just to poison an old man, 
he took a bite. The flavor was far stronger than he had anticipated. It seemed to be a mixture of both sweet and sour tastes with gooey and consistency that stuck to the roof of his mouth. Not bad, huh? added the human as Ragar took a second bite before handing it back to the colonel. You see, said the colonel as he placed the last bird of cake in his mouth, the cargo pilot who gave us your location said that a large portion of your planet was in the midst of a serious drought, and as a result you're experiencing a food shortages. So you came all this way to bring us food? No, not just food, but we figured that you would be a way to break the ice, so to speak. It is true, replied the elderly alien, that we're experiencing a drought and food is tight, but no one on this world is starving to death that I'm aware of. But no one turns down free food, and I'm sure that there are needy amongst you that could benefit from the extra food. Of that, there can be no doubt, replied the elderly alien. Tossing a packet and the remains of the contents back into the large container, the colonel replaced the lid. Turning, the human started back down the ramp. Ragar followed him. On reaching the bottom, the human effortlessly stepped from the elevator platform. Turning, he extended his hand and helped the old alien negotiate the difficult last step. Pointing down the line and stopped transports, the human said, Paps, we have five truckloads of MREs that we plan to distribute to your people. I see far more than five transports, added the elderly alien as he looked down the row of stopped vehicles. So you do, replied the human colonel. Stepping back, the colonel seemed to visually examine Ragar from head to toe. Let me guess, you are about 65 years old. I don't know how the years in the planet compare to yours, but I've been on this world for 58 winters. Before that, I was 32 conference years old, but these years are a little shorter. 90. The human placed his lips together and made a whistling sound. Well, since conference years are a little shorter than Earth years, I don't think I'm too far off in Earth years. Without giving Ragar time to answer, the human continued. Perhaps I've been watching you walk. You have arthritis, don't you? I don't understand that term. Arthritis is a disease of joints experienced by nearly all vertebrates as they advance in years. Ah yes, I do have such condition, although it is known by a different name amongst Lotharians. And if you were not out here, the back side of the galaxy, so to speak, you would have received the treatment for your condition. Ragar lowered his head. Yes, it is treatable, but this world has very little in the way of physicians or medical facilities. Each town has at least a doctor or two, but due to the limited outside contact, medical supplies and drugs are quite scarce. Stepping out of the path that the transports had been traveling, the human pointed down the line of vehicles, the first five trucks holding food. But do you see the larger vehicles further back? I do. The next batch of trucks are hauling fully equipped field hospital. A hospital? Yes, we are going to make sure that from this moment forward the people of this world have access to the same medical available throughout the entire rest of the galaxy. As for continued the human, the rest of the vehicles, they contain various supplies and trade items, as well as support for residential quarters for humans that will be staying here until this is all running smoothly. Ragar stood considering everything that he had just heard and seen. The meeting that many had feared would announce the end of the world seemed instead to be poised to usher in a new age for its inhabitants. The human stood in silence for long moments, waiting for Ragar to make his next move. Colonel, this day certainly did not turn out as I expected. Many of my fellow citizens feared that you had come here to... Uh... Ragar bowed his head. Honestly, many on this world feared that you were here to kill us all. You said that before, responded the colonel. No, as you can plainly see, we come bearing gifts and open arms. Looking back at the human's eyes, Ragar continued, Colonel, there are many fearful citizens gathered in town. It would be best if I return to town and inform them of your intentions ahead of your arrival. The colonel looked up at the sky. Looks like we have a few hours of daylight left. Go tell your people why we are here. While he was speaking, he turned to the passenger compartment of the vehicle, Opening the door, he reached in and received a small black rectangular-shaped object with a short extension that wobbled as though it was in a spring. Handing it to the yellow-skinned alien, he continued to speak. This is a walkie-talkie, a communication device. Press the button on the side and speak into the grilled one and when you want to talk to me. Release the button and you will be able to hear what I say. Remember to press the button to speak and release it to listen. When you have prepared everyone for our arrival, call me and we will follow you into town. Ragar took the object from the colonel. Very well, colonel. I hope that they will all be reasonable as you seem to be. With that, he turned and moved into the direction of his son's vehicle. 
still sitting exactly where he had stopped a short time ago. Before he could reach the vehicle, his son stood and raced to meet him. As he opened his mouth to speak, the elderly father cut him off. Son, I know you have questions, but please wait to ask them once we're in town. Continuing to the passenger door, the son opened it and waited until his father was comfortable. Returning to the operator position, the son expertly maneuvered the vehicle, and in moments they were speeding back towards the town. As they drove, Ragar considered what had just transpired. The human colonel claimed that they were on a mission of peace, not occupation, and that the food and medical supplies they brought seemed to confirm these words. However, the numbers of humans and the amount of supplies could certainly feed the support and occupying force for a very long time. Crossing his hands over the top of his walking stick, he looked out the window to the rain gliding past him. Gods help us if they're lying, he said softly before his son to hear. Colonel Armstrong blew a ring of smoke from his now short cigar as he watched the alien vehicle disappear over the hill, speaking only to himself and so softly that his words carried away with the wind. How could he have possibly known the name of Paris? End of story number two. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, please consider supporting the author from the link down below. Otherwise, if you wish to support this channel, there are numerous ways to do so, like liking, subscribing, and possibly even becoming a patron. Otherwise, the easiest way would be to share. And until the next video, I hope that you all have a good one, and I'll see you then. Cheers.